my name is Jill Coyle and welcome to another episode of No One Dies From Divorce, where we talk the nitty gritty aspects of divorce and help each other come through this not only surviving, but thriving. I'm a divorce attorney and I'm interviewing other experts and people just like you who are going through or have been through a divorce so you can have the latest and greatest information on all things before, during, and after divorce. Let's dive in. Welcome to another episode of No One Dies From Divorce. Um, Today's amazing guest is Abby Medcalf, Dr. Abby Medcalf. Um, I am just so excited that you were going to be on my show today. Say hello to all of our listeners. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks, Jill. This is always fun to hang with you. Oh, my gosh. Um, I got introduced to Abby because I, as everybody knows, I did a docuseries, No One Dies From Divorce, and I I wanted to meet you and see if you could be part of that. And then we ended up just having a phone call, like a Skype session or something. And I was just like, I like you. I just knew it. I just was like, she, you, I, you, now that I think of it, maybe the New Yorker a little bit, but you are just, you're fantastic. And what you're doing um, in your fields is just been amazing. So I'm grateful to know you. Thank you. Oh, me, I feel the same. Thank you. That's so nice. So let me introduce Abby. So she is a relationship maven, psychologist, author, podcast host, and TEDx speaker who has helped thousands of people think differently so they can create connection, ease, and joy in their relationships, especially the one with yourself. I love that. With her unique background in both business and consulting, she brings a fresh, effective perspective to life struggles using humor and her direct, no-nonsense style. There's that New Yorker right there. With over 30 years of experience, Abby is a recognized authority and sought-after speaker at organizations such as Google, Apple, at t Kaiser, PG&E, American Airlines, and Chevron. She's been a featured expert on CBS and ABC News and has been a contributor to HuffPost, Women's Health, and Bustle. I love it. She's also the author of the number one Amazon best-selling book, Be Happily Married, Even If Your Partner Won't Do a Thing. And she's the host of the top-rated Relationships Made Easy podcast. Her new book, and this was exciting when I read this, and program Negative Thinking Sucks and Not in a Good Way, will be out soon. Oh my gosh, I love it, <laughs> Abby. It's so good. I, I, you probably know this, but Empowered Women, Empower Women. And I just, you're doing exactly what I'm trying to do is just be an empowerment, a beacon of light to help other people recognize that we have inner strength in ourself. We just need to recognize it. We just need to let it out. Yep. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. I was just talking to my, um, business manager and, you know, I'm looking to, I'm going to be doing some like merchandise, you know, and, uh, some shirts and mugs and things. And I was really trying to encapsulate, you know, what I'm all about. What, what would you want to wear? What would I want people to wear or walk around with? And, uh, you know, I'm a recovery, I'm a recovery heroin addict. So I'm always sort of playing off of that. And I want the front of the shirt to say under the influence. And I want the back to say of joy. Yes. And right. And that's really what we're talking about. It's like, you know, being under the influence in a wonderful way where, right. where you look at your partner, you look at yourself, you look in the mirror, you look everywhere with compassion, with joy, with love, with ease, with, you know, that that's really what all my work is about and really what you're doing. Right. That's what it's about. Let's be under the influence together of the good stuff. The really good stuff. The really good stuff. Exactly. And, and, and helping us understand that there is a better, there is a better way. There's a better path. I want people to know. So, so tell, tell our audience something that would maybe, um, they just love to hear about you. uh, Just an interesting fact about you. Uh, well, I probably just shared that one, that I'm a, a recovering heroin addict. Um, but everybody I, knows that because uh, if they go and read your story. Do they know it now because I talk about it? <laughs> there you go. Uh, that um, 
Uh, what else video? Well, I, I do talk about food a lot, and uh, my dad was a chef, and I'm a gourmet cook, and I love to love up the people in my life with food. Like, I do it everywhere. It's one of my favorite things to do is to cook Amazing. for people, to have people over, to eat together. Um, I'm all about the food. I'm well, a food pervert. How, what if we say that? Like, I love hearing about food no matter what it is. That's amazing. Uh, I could talk about it. I am a, um, I like to eat good food. So mm-hmm. my favorite thing is to find, well, my favorite thing, my husband and I's favorite thing is to find very, very great restaurants of amazing food in all different parts of the world. And um, mm. I I definitely like to eat it. I would not say that I am very good at cooking it. So... Oh. <laughs> But that, but Abby, that goes right along with your, um, your quote. If you go to your website, which is fabulous, by the way, um, you have this quote and it comes right up. It says, great relationships are not built in a day. Great relationships are built daily. And I just got chills just saying that. So tell everybody, obviously that's your mantra. That's your philosophy. Tell, tell people how you kind of got that purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, because so much of what we do in relationships and romance, you know, a lot of times couples are very good, actually, at the big decisions. Should we send our kids to private school? Should we move? Should we buy a house? Should I quit my job? That's actually a time when a lot of couples come together and are pretty good. The problem is those times are once a year, maybe. You know, they're not common, the the big decisions. So that's not really what makes a great relationship, but that's what I'll hear people say. They'll say, oh, but we, you know, really have the same values and we, you know, think the same. We were always able to decide to move to do this together. I don't know why we fight all the time. (laughs) It's like, because that has nothing to do with it. Right. It's every single day that we build our relationships that we really, every day, I call them micro connections that we make with our partners. That's where the meat of the sandwich is. It is not in the big ones. So you, and when you're really looking to even be in a relationship, and for some people listening who are divorced and looking to get into a new one, you're not, you're not just looking for someone with your values. That that's that's not, or you know, can make decisions together. Because I hear people say that. Well, you gotta right. be able to make decisions together. I'm like, well, yeah, you do. That's good. But you need someone on a day to day basis who thinks like you do, who thinks expansively, lovingly who vulnerably, who, who really is there with you on a day-to-day basis. And there's a lot of ways every day that you can be building the relationship. So you don't wait till once a week, you know, therapy session or something. <laughs> it, I, I always say to folks that it's just like getting fit. You know, if you wanted to get really fit and toned and you hired a personal trainer once a week, that's great. But if you did nothing in between and you ate like crap and you didn't exercise, you're never going to get fit. It's right. never going to happen. It's every day. And it's not just once a day, right? It's all day long. I'm eating a certain way all day. I'm, you know, thinking of taking extra steps here. I'm then going to, maybe you do go to the gym. Maybe I go for a walk with my friend instead of sitting. There's all these things you do if you really, truly want to get fit. That, and it's the same way with your relationship. If you really, truly want to feel connection you have to build the connections all day. And because one of the problems I think behind marriage and is that you start having those cracks. Like you said, they're, they can be very small and minute. And at the time, you don't find that they're, going, they're that big of a deal because you're still managing the big stuff. But we allow those little cracks to just start getting deeper. And we keep waiting for the other person to be the one to fill that crack. And then what happens is yep. the crack just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And then, like you said, all of a sudden you 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 know you're across the Grand Canyon from each other, and you're like, oh, um, maybe we should try to work on a relationship. And you know they're like, whatever, it's too late. Like I'm I've sold that. And so it's so much yep. about yep. It, it, it. And if we were to really get down, it's just like you said about doing this on a daily basis. We yep. We want to never let the cracks get so big that they become insurmountable or they become to where it's an impossibility. Yeah, I agree. And I, and you know, when I really, when I talk about that to people, these micro connections, I want folks to understand it is not just, 
I think again, if you're like, oh, we're gonna have date night, or we're gonna sit and I, I actually have, I think, a blog or a podcast somewhere that it's called No More Date Night. <laughs> date nights, I find, and I hate. I have so many couples come to me, and every one of them says, oh yeah, our therapist told us to have a date night. And I'm like, ah, if you could have a date night, that's what you'd already be doing, right? Like you wouldn't need. You really need to build and what. Ever have sex later? I don't even want to have sex anymore. You know, it's like pressure. There's all this pressure to like do something fabulous. Who's going to plan it? People end up fighting over the date night, and it's and again, that's one of the bigger things. Instead, again, break it down. You know, when your partner walks in the house, stop what you're doing, whatever it is, I don't care, and go say hi. Go to the front door, greet them, give them your full attention. There is nothing more generous. Or more loving than a hundred percent of your attention. Yes. But you do not have to give it all. So, you know, Gary and I have a whole thing when he, <laughs> when either of us is out and the other one comes home, you know, we run to the front door, like a, like a, we joke, it's like a golden retriever, you know, how golden retrievers. Right. Are and so they're so excited to see that. Up and down. They're so excited. So be that way for your partner, partner, you know, when they come home, show that enthusiasm, be excited to yeah. see them. It takes a minute i'm telling you not even a minute most of the time and you know they will make out at the front door for a minute you know have those kisses that last longer than six seconds that's a from the work of john gottman you know like really connect for i'm so glad yeah then go back to whatever you were doing you don't have to stay there you don't have to have a whole meal with them you don't have to do anything but whatever it is, really pay attention in a moment. And that's a micro connection. Yeah. You know, when you, if you come in and say, hey, you know, what do you want for dinner? And they go, oh, anything, it doesn't matter, whatever you want. You can stop and go and, you know, get, get their attention. No, 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 stop watching TV for a second. You know, come off your computer or your phone just for a second with love, you know, say it lovingly. But like, like help me figure out dinner. You know, like, oh, let, let's throw out three ideas. Let's talk for one sec. You know, again, it's a two minute conversation, but it's that little connection. It's that little piece that, and you build those up. And that's really what you use when things happen and they will that you don't like. You have to have money in the bank. And those micro connections are money in the bank so that you can get, take a withdrawal and it doesn't feel like you're, you know, you've overdrawn the account, yeah. which is what happens, right? So when your partner makes the divorce worthy mistake of dragging the peanut butter, you know, the knife directly from the peanut butter into the jelly, right. <laughs> you know, you right, don't right, right, feel right. like, you know, every, there's no one listening who hasn't had a fight that's so horrible and yelling that we're going to, I need a divorce. I need space when it was over nothing Yep. over nothing. And you look back and go, how did that happen? And again, it's because there was a, you were overdrawn in the account. You, know, yeah. you have to build that resilience into the relationship. And that's those micro connections. That's all day. That's how you build a great relationship. That's amazing. Yeah. And that's exactly right. I, the, the funny thing about my marriage and what I've learned is that when I, we were first went to marriage counseling and I was going and I was like on this, you know, Oh, I'm going to, this therapist is going to tell my husband everything he's doing wrong. And one of those were his socks that he used to throw on the ground used to, I should say used to, no, he throws on the ground. He gets into bed and he takes his socks off and he throws them on the ground. It's just something. And I remember at year four, I think that's when we went to um, marriage counseling and my marriage counselor looked at me and she said, you know what, Jill, you can decide if you want to divorce over socks or if we're really going to get to the problem of why his socks make you so mad. And I was just like, what? And so that, that just reminded me of exactly what you're saying is, is that we allow the, the, when the little stuff are driving us so crazy or causing the chasm that are going to break the marriage, it's obviously something deeper and that's where we need to get, yeah. get to. And that's why I want to, I want to break into your book because when I read your book, be happily married, even if your partner won't do a thing. The first thing I wanted to tell you is that that title is the best title you could have come up with. Because the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to read it. And I don't, I got to give my husband credit. It, he does a lot of things. So I'm not saying he doesn't, but mm -hmm. that title was very, very catchy. So tell me a little bit about your thinking and your thoughts behind writing a book like this. Well, you know, I found in my work, um, in my corporate work, when I was working with executives who had drug and alcohol problems and uh, I was only meeting with them, I was 
finding that I was helping their marriages tremendously. And I had never met these, they were all men. I'd never met these wives. And uh, it was, I thought, and over time I thought, that's kind of weird. And I actually, when I started to track things, I realized, I found that I had the same or better results working with an individual than with a couple. Okay. And I started to really track that and really look at that. And I realized, and it's in a way, you know, when a couple comes in, right, they're, it's a different mentality than if you come in alone and go, I want to work on my, right? You already are taking responsibility for the, you know, you're already taking that on when you come in alone. So that's one thing there. But the other piece is this, it's, it's, it's your brain. And I, and what I do that's different is I help you to really truly get unhijack your brain. And so here is what normally happens in any couple's work or anything that goes on or anyone who reads my book or takes a workshop or does whatever. And actually not my book, because I explain this in my book, but you know, a lot of books, there's a lot of really good books out there with really good tools and then, or workshops or whatever. And then they, it doesn't last. People do it for a little bit and they go back to old patterns or they're just convinced, well, my partner won't change. So this, this relationship will never change. And what they're missing is this. So our brains process information, our conscious brains, at a rate of 50 bits per second, while our unconscious or our subconscious brains process information at a rate of 11 million bits per second. And really what this means, I talk about it in my TED Talk, I talk about it in the book. What it means is that people don't hear, your partner doesn't hear what you say, they hear what you mean. Yeah. And so what happens generally is that couples, let's say a, a, a woman comes in and I give her a great tool to work on her relationship and she's in the office and she's excited. She's like, yes, that feels great. I'm so inspired, blah, blah, blah. She goes home and, but on the ride, on the drive home, she's thinking, I don't know. You know, the doubt starts to creep in. Right. right? I've already been to a few other therapists. Nothing ever worked before. Uh, you know, he won't change. I don't know how anything's going to change if he won't, or we've had this problem a really long time. Some little tools, not going to really help right all the doubt. Then she goes home. She practices this new tool with her husband and he is picking up on that 11 million bits. He is picking up on the doubt. So again, she's saying one thing, but he's here. He's feeling and hearing another with his subconscious. So he, cause he gets that 11 million bits too. And so he's doubting, he's doubting, he's thinking, oh, well, she's being nice to me now. Let's see how long that lasts. Right. And he's right in his head. And we've all thought this, this can be you, not the other person, whoever's listening. And so she's practicing the tool for maybe she sticks with it for a week or two, but he's still waiting. He's like, yeah, this is going to go away. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to trust it. And then she, he doesn't change. So she does give up. She's right. like, oh, I knew it wouldn't work. And she comes back to my office and tells me how wrong I am. And I'm like, no, <laughs> this is not, no, I'm not. This tool is gold. And you need to really, you can't go in, let's say, because what I hear from folks all the time is, well, how long do I have to do it? <laughs> yeah. How long do I have to be the one? Yeah. And as soon as I hear that, I tell them, uh, it's not going to work. You might as well stop now. You, you can't, if I went to a job, and I thought the whole time I should be getting a raise and a promotion, but I was putting in like 50% because I was waiting, you know, they, they better show me how good I am. I'm mm-hmm. great. I've been here two whole weeks. Tell me, I've done this so many times with these executives I work with. They have like a brand new assistant. Right. And like two weeks in, she's looking for a raise and they're, or he's looking for a raise and they're like, what? You just got here. What are you talking about? It's this unrealistic expectation, right? And so when you have that, when you're holding that in your relationship, the, uh, again, the other person is picking up on the 11 million bits again. Yeah. That this is conditional. This is going to be, again, it's conditional because you're doing it only to get something back. Right. You have to do it with full love. And you have to go back to why you married this person to begin with. You have to go back to what you thought you knew years ago. And you got to go back to the love. What I talked about in the beginning, you got to be under the influence of love. You got to go back to I am a hundred percent putting it now, by the way, this, I hear, I can already hear people. It's like, I'm going to get taken advantage of. Yeah. I'm going to get, I don't trust you. Yep. And I will tell you that that is your fear talking that, and no love relationship is made better by fear. It will not do it. And I am not talking about putting in 150%. That 
that's codependency. Right. I am just talking about putting in your full love. Full love just takes nothing from you. It is not hard to do. It's not. It doesn't mean you do everything in the house. It doesn't mean that, you know, you clean up and you know, do all the things that the other person's not doing. I'm not talking about doing. I'm talking about feeling and loving. So that even if this other person's not doing the thing, so you would look at that sock on the floor and think, you know what? He is doing the best he can with the tools he has. If he's leaving his socks on the floor, it doesn't mean he doesn't love me. It doesn't mean he doesn't appreciate me. It doesn't mean he thinks I'm his maid. That's the big problem people make. They, yeah. they, they make a definition of what it means when someone else is doing something. And, and you're off course, by the way. You're, you're, it's not true. That is not why he was leaving the socks on the floor. Right. He was leaving the socks on the floor because he was overwhelmed at the end of the day because it wasn't important to him. And he didn't really, you know, he, he didn't understand why you would think it was so important. Right. So I know why. I, I bet I could be in that couple session. I know what's there. And so it's like, what are we? So instead, you could have lied in bed or woke up the next morning and seen the socks. Yep. Number one, you could have just picked them up. It takes two friggin' seconds, right, to think, I'm going to be of service and pick up the socks. I'm just going to be of service. Love this guy. The socks take two minutes. They bother me, not him. Yeah. So this is really about me and my being more comfortable. But let's even say you leave the socks. I could also just with love go, you know what? I'm going to leave the socks. I don't want to be resentful about picking it up because I love him. It's his sock. But I am going to work on not letting it bother me. It doesn't have to bother me. Yeah. And I'm going to choose that path right now. You Either way, do you see? It's just love. Yep. So one way, you didn't have to do one more thing. You did not have to do one more thing. And the other way, maybe you could have done the other thing, but you don't have to. So yep. you're not going to get taken advantage of. You're not. And this is a person you're sharing your life with. If you really are worried about them taking advantage of you, really? Yeah. Is that really what you're worried about? It's not. Right. So let that go. Let that be. And just be in loving service. And if this relationship isn't meant to be, I promise, I promise you will know. You will just know, not in a month, not in two weeks that you gave this, you know, mm -hmm. but you will come to see it over time because you're looking at the relationship through a lens of love. Yeah. You're looking at it in a loving, respectful way, and that will come back to you. You will see it. You, uh, you will. I, I'm telling you, I'm doing this 35 years. I see it all the time. And that way of being in the world, by the way, because I, what I like to tell people to remind them of is that wherever you end this relationship, you're going to begin your next one. Yes. So you have to end well anyway. If I told you how many people I've talked to who have divorced an alcoholic only to marry one again, yep. I it's unbelievable. And they'll I hear the same story. He wasn't drinking when I married him or she wasn't using drugs when I married her, you know. And it's not a coincidence, people. It's not no. a coincidence. It's you are getting or they just have the same kind of relationship with somebody who doesn't listen or they feel underappreciated or not understood or whatever it is. It you will keep repeating it. So you got to figure this out now anyway. Yes. And by the way, if you have kids, you really have to figure it out. Yeah. You're going to have these kids the rest of your life. Yep. So you don't, to me, you don't have a choice. Yeah. At that point, you don't have a choice. My ex and I get along great. Matter of fact, it's his wife's birthday today, my kid's stepmom, and I made her birthday cake. Oh. <laughs> That's what I was doing yesterday. I made this gorgeous cake it's for amazing. her. She likes my baking, and she's amazing. This is a woman who loves my kids. She's wonderful to them. I couldn't ask for a better like stepmom in their lives. I really couldn't. And I'm grateful. And we're a big family. You know, our family has extended. There is no reason to be any other way. I yeah. don't have to be jealous of her or anything else. This is someone who is bringing more love into our lives. My kids feel more love. They're, come on. And I was going to say that, like a lot of people think that when they divorce, they're taking like that easy way out that they're going, it's going to fix whatever yep. is going wrong. And I kind of laugh because I'm like, if you think that divorcing somebody is going to then solve your problems of who you are and what you need, you're mistaken. And then if you kind of communicate with your spouse in the marriage, whatever makes you think you're going to be an effective and good co-parent. And one of the things my mission in life is helping people understand is if 50% of marriages are going to end in divorce, why don't we want to make this a purpose of making ourselves better, make us better communicators, um, somehow create, you know, help us move forward into a more empathetic role so that our kids can succeed? 
Because if we don't, if we're going to be that toxic person, if we're going to be that person, like you said, that jumps into another toxic relationship or another codependency relationship, and we ourselves have never done the work to learn what we need to be, you know, a better communicator, a better lover, a better co-parent, you know, we're just setting our next situation, our next relationship, and especially our kids up to fail. I wholeheartedly agree. I, you know, for me, I don't see... Uh, I, I really like people to reframe this whole idea of like a failed marriage. It's the, if you get divorced or just break up or whatever, it's right. not a failure. What does it even mean? Like right. that the only goal is that you're married forever. That's the only one you're allowed to have. Right. It's crazy. So I don't see my marriage as a failed marriage, the first marriage at all. Uh, he, it was a wonderful relationship with these gorgeous kids. It's still a good relationship. Like, it just, we, for us, were growing in different directions. Yeah. It wasn't, we were going to end up hating each other. We didn't want right. to do that. That's how much we loved each other. Right. So to really love and honor where he was and is and where I am, you know, that that's what, how we did it. So we did it well. You know, we did it really lovingly and, and, and graciously and generously. We That's how we approach it. And we still do. And that, again, my kids are calm, wonderful, loving, kind humans, you know, and that's, that's what you get from that. So, but again, it's not, I was thinking of, uh, you remember Al and Tipper Gore, (laughs) they were married, I don't know, I think 40 years or something. And then they finally got divorced. Like, I don't know how long ago, not later, like in their seventies. And that's not a failed marriage. Are you kidding me? They, I'm not saying I, you know, so crazy about either of them or whatever. I'm not, not, but I don't know that. Right, but right. when I look at that relationship over decades and the public service and the many things that happen, this is not a failed marriage and they have great kids and they're, you know, doing things in the world and they still support each other. I love it. They just got to a place where that was no longer working for them right. as individuals. So to me, divorce does not have to even really going to your book, you know, not only do you not have to, you're going to die from it, but you can be better from it. Yeah. And you can really, like you're saying, really reach another level of yourself. I mean, how beautiful and wonderful is that? So, and to see these along the way, it's so funny, you know, I had friends for many years when I was in like high school and, and, you know, and I don't have those friends anymore. I don't consider them failed friendships. I don't, I don't consider them like, they were bad and I never should have had them. Right. I think, well, those are friends those years when I was that person. Needed that experience. And yeah. And so I don't know why we decide that our romantic relationships are any different and it does not need to be, I swear to you, it does not have to be. And you can let your past relationships, I always say, make you better, not better. Yes. And really kind of move forward. And it's people like us that are just making the movement that divorce isn't a shameful thing. It's still where, when you say, oh, I'm divorced, you know, people kind of shy, you know, and they, they think of it as a shameful subject. And I'm like looking at them like, oh, everybody knows somebody is divorced. Like we need to stop looking at it that way. Just like you said, it's a movement. It should be a movement. You know, we have so many, and it should be an experience, an experience of learning because exactly right. Like, the, whatever, if you believe in the cosmic of, you know, you, that there's only one person out there for you. I mean, I just don't, I just know that we have experience in life that hopefully are teaching us and putting us on a path of being a better human being. And if we were to look at divorce like that, wow, we're going to have a lot of people moving forward to be better humans. And that's what I want. I want to live in a community full of really good people. I don't need to live in a community of really good marriages, <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> That's so great. I love it. It's wonderful. And so one of the things that I love from your book, when I read it, I was like, this is cool, is that you talk a lot about how failed marriages usually are because we use our marriage as competition. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, yeah. Where you like talk about, I you, I remember you did an experience where you're like the dishwasher. Oh, I'm keeping score. I did the dishwasher today. So tomorrow it's your turn to do the dish. And that we're living in this state of competition. And I just was like taken aback for somebody who I'm a very, very competitive person. 
it kind of just like set me back to think, oh my gosh, that's so me. That's my husband's very, very competitive as well. I can see how sometimes we do that. Like, oh, you put the kids to bed last night. Now it's your turn kind of thing. And, and I love that. So talk a little bit more about your theory behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Yeah. The number one, pro the number one reason relationships fail is not communication. It's competition. Yes. And it is, it's what's, it's why you're not communicating. Right. So unless you take care of this first, because it, we do that, we learned it from our parents. We It's been time immemorial that there's this competition. So I'm doing, you know, I took Sophie to baseball practice on Monday. So it's your turn on Friday to take Jack to piano or whatever, right? We we divvy up time and money. Those, those are the big resources in a family. Uh, if I bought something expensive in the marriage, right? Now you get to buy something expensive in yeah. the marriage. You know, that's what's fair. We have right. to be worried about fair. And that is not it at all because you're setting yourselves on opposite teams when you do that. If if I'm if I think that if you get something, I get less, then I don't want you to win. I don't yep. want you to get more. I, I had a couple not long ago and the husband got a um, he got a, a promotion and he was going to be traveling around Europe a lot, which that's what it meant. You know, in the company, he's going to be traveling. He really wanted this promotion. And her, he told her in session, and her re initial reaction was, oh, great. Now I guess I'll just be home, stuck at home taking care of the kids while you're traveling all over Europe having a great time. Hmm. And that, and that's not uncommon. A lot of right. people are like, oh, it means I get less because you're going to be gone more. And now I'm expected to work my job and take more care of the kids. And so you've got to get that your marriage, your any relationship, marriage or not, is a shared resource. If your partner is winning, that is more for your battery of your relationship. If if your partner is drained, then that's draining the battery of your relationship. Yeah. So there's a few things you can do there. There's really two. You can add or subtract. So what you want to do if you're seeing each other as a shared resource and you don't want to always be asking your partner partners do this all the time. There's right. something that has to happen in the marriage and their immediate reaction is to look at the other person to list all the things they did and why the other person should do it. And again, that's keeping score, which means you're going to lose. That's what you do in games. It's not going to work in a relationship. You have to see each other as the same team. So you, the team wants to win, right. which means that you either you add or subtract, you can add things. So instead of thinking, Oh, uh, Sophie needs to be driven around now to, you know, like this happened in, in my, one of my kids, you know, got on a travel team young. Max is very good at baseball. He was on a travel team. So the immediate reaction wasn't like, oh, you have to take him or I have to take him. We hired a driver. We yeah. hired a, a kid to drive my kids more. We add a resource from outside the couple. If it's something you have to do, if I was deciding, oh, well, I have to drive him because it's far and I want to be with my kid then I might have added a resource to take care of the house more, to walk the dog, right. to pick up the dog poop in the backyard, to do the laundry, to, you know, add resources. You're both doing everything you can. You're both burnt out. Like, you can't just keep saying who's the more burnt out of the two. Right. And by the way, that's not just money. You could barter. You could ask some, you know, hey, mother of the kid I barely know. <laughs> to <laughs> help with kid, carpool. You know, yeah. Could you carpool on Monday and Wednesday and I'll take the kids on Tuesdays and Thursdays? You know, there's a lot of ways to do it. But the other thing you could do is subtract. You can take things off your collective plate. Right. You could decide what does it, does, does little Sophie really have to learn a language and take an instrument and be in two sports? Like, <laughs> is, is that what you think that she's not going to have a fair shot at life unless she, no. She needs parents who are feeling calm and focused and happy and loving. That's what little Sophie needs. Yeah. And so she will figure out college and everything else. People come from some very scary backgrounds with nothing and get to college. Yes. So you really, the, the emphasis like that is crazy. So slow down, which by the way, is the number one complaint of kids in every monitoring the future study that gets done every year. The number one complaint is that parents rush them too much. Yes. Number one complaint. So stop rushing them. Take things off the plate so there's not as much to do. There's not as much that you have to, you know, ne negotiate and navigate in the relationship. But don't just keep looking to your partner because when you do that, you are taking from yourself because you are yeah. taking, you're draining your partner, you're taking from the shared relationship. And so what I told this couple with this woman who was upset, 
I was like, you guys have to hire more help for home while you're gone. That's what needs to get added here. That's what you do. So that it's not just this woman who was expected to take on so much. So she could be fresh and okay. Yeah. By the time he came home, because what usually happens, he comes home from business trip, he's burnt. Right. Those aren't vacations. I used to be that one flying. Like they're burning, right? You get home, all you want to do is relax and see, and and then you know, the person at home is like, Here's the kids. Yep. I'm out, you know. And so now everyone is burnt. This isn't a winning recipe. So you've got to, again, it's a simple shift, but it's a, it's a really important one to keep looking to your partner as your teammate. You are a shared resource. You have to treat it like that. Well, I'm going to take this a little bit step further because if you're divorced and you have to co-parent with that person that you divorced, this is exactly what you need to be doing. So one of the things as I see is like these parents just hate each other and they just have all this animosity and they just, uh, you know, and, and I, I say this, like you can be a really bad husband, but a really good dad, you know, you can't, yep. you can't play in the, oh, without doubt. but one of the things I see is that, you know, I break it down and I, I'm like, look it, you know, you, you're frustrated with him for whatever he did, or you're frustrated with her for whatever she did. But at the end of the day, what is your common goal that you guys have with your kids? And usually they're yeah. like, well, he doesn't parent the way I do or, you know, they, but then finally we get down to the bottom and I'm like, do you guys both want your kids to succeed? Do you want yeah. them to both be successful? And both of them will say yes. And I say, great. Okay. Let's start there. Because if you know that the other parent wants to see your kids succeed, stop being the person that's fighting against it. Get on the same team, just like you said. I love that. And fight for your kids to succeed together. Yes. And you yep. can do that being non married. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. And you I, can. Without a doubt. And I think in some, in some ways, it's even. I've had some parents that I've worked with who are divorced sort of joke that it's even easier in a way because they have usually time away from their kids. Yeah. Right? Which you normally don't have. If you're just, uh, just married, it right, sounds kids. fabulous and, to me, just so uh, you know, I'm exactly. like, I have four kids so in like, like the worst ages and I'm right? like, I would love an every other well, weekend situation. I mean, can you imagine? So I say to them, use your time yeah. off well. Yeah. Don't just use it for like, oh, I have to get done everything I couldn't get done when the kids were here or whatever. Re try to, again, get yourself individual help if you can or if you need to or however you want to do that. So that you can feel full and right there when you're having the, and have the bandwidth to deal with this emotional part, which is yes. the managing on the other side. And so really think of that. And I, and I have had people go, you know, it's actually, it's better in a lot of ways, yes. you know, having this time where I get to really just be on my own. And so, it, and it's, and you don't have to feel guilty for that parents. You know, you really no. don't. I, I have some parents feel so guilty about it. And I would, I, and I usually just say that to them. I'm like, if you were away on business versus this, you know, it is what it is. If you had to support your family and you had no other way, you would do it. So now you're supporting your family in this way, you're divorced. Yep. And so, you know, really use the time well, like, and you can do that, but I'm with you a thousand percent on that. Absolutely. And then that's why, you know, when you get to this space, I, I think we've touched on two so important points today is first of all, fixing yourself, understanding what you need, your self-worth, um, and then creating this ability to communicate. But then second of all, being able to even uh, I, stand on your own two feet. I think that whenever I get to my message, that's my last, that's exactly like every point I make is to that. We have to get to the point where we recognize our happiness comes from within. It's us. It's what do we need and how are we filling our cup? And a marriage isn't going to fill your cup. In fact, if your cup's drained, just like you said, it's going to, it's not going to be, your, and you're continually looking at your partner to fill your cup. It's not going to happen. You fill your cup and then the, and then your marriage elevates it. It kind of, you know, yep. I guess enhances it. So, so I remember, you know, when I was in therapy with my husband, it was, it was so prevalent to the therapist that Jill, what are you doing to fill your cup? And so 
So what are ways that you teach these couples or even individuals, whether they're pre or post divorce to be doing that, to be filling their cup? Oh yeah. You know, this whole (laughs) self-care, you know, this whole self-care thing, self-care has really taken to me a wrong turn in that it, especially for what what, men do. No, I'm going to give it to men too. Because what happens is it's like, oh, self-care means I go get a man petty and I get a massage and I go do these things and I'm already feeling like I have no time. Yes. So now I can't take care of myself, right? I can't do it. I can't wake up earlier and meditate. I can't do that. And that is not self-care. I mean, it's mm-hmm. nice. It's great to do. Self-care is really emotional connection. Yes. That's when we feel cared for. You, you have to spend time in your emotional relationships with other people. And that means usually friendships. Sometimes it can be a sibling or two. Sometimes it can be a parent. It depends on your particular, my family's really crazy. So it definitely wasn't them. Uh, (laughs) So for me, it was my, you know, my best girlfriends. I have very close girlfriends that I am super, super close with that are there for me, you know, very, for me, low maintenance relationships. If I don't call, it's okay. I need those, I need those kind of relationships can't be someone gets butt hurt because I didn't text back or didn't call back because they know me. They love me. It's abundance. It's, it's openness. They know, oh, she must have been too busy. Yeah. They don't take it personally. So it's those kind of relationships. But when I need them or they need me, they really need me. You know, if it's not just like a chit chat, I'm going to be there a thousand percent. Yes. That's how we are. And so I feel like I, I am heard. I am loved. I am held. I am understood. I am cherished in these relationships. Yes. And that is the, that's self-care. Self-care is emotional. It's not a to-do list. Yes. And so you've got to focus on that. And by the way, it is not sitting around moaning and complaining to your, you know, best friend about your ex. Mm -hmm. That is not self-care. That is nothing to do with it. It's about what you want to do now. How, where do you want to go now? Yes. You know, your ex is your past. (laughs) Yes. Or it's your recent past if you're co-parenting and you're complaining about that. But again, it needs to be in a frame because it's just going to make you feel worse. It, you know, when we talk about things that are upsetting, it just makes us feel more upset. And it brings, as we know, kind of more of that energy around. Like right. that 50 versus 11 million bits I talked about. If I'm in a head of steam all the time about my ex and then I talk to my ex, guess what? Even if I'm nice, even if I use nice words, yes. they pick up on the other. Yeah. And so you really want to cultivate feelings of love and compassion as best you can for your, whoever your ex is, or whoever your current is. Right. And so as best you can. And so those relationships with your, with your people should really be about you. How are you? Like, what are, you know, how are you feeling? What, what can I do right now to help you feel understood? What can I do right now to help you feel love and connection and cherished and appreciated? Absolutely. And, you know, and, and that's different than that other stuff. So yeah. So self-care is not a to-do list. Yes. I completely agree. And like just hearing you say that, especially as women, we struggle so much with that. I mean, and I was just saying before we came on the podcast that I do feel like I need a little bit more female connection. Like, Abby, we need to go to the Bahamas together or something because I feel like... (laughs) Because I'm the same as you. I'm so busy and it's, I, I give so much of myself to other people and you're right. I'm getting manicures and pedicures. And so people are thinking, is that self-care? And I'm like still feeling drained. And so we have to take care of ourselves and whether you're going through a divorce, if you're thinking about a divorce or you're post divorce, it all comes down to one thing. And that is you. What are you worthy of? So today, remember you're worthy of connection. You're worthy of love. You're worthy of um, being heard and being seen. And it all comes down to you understanding that and then learning the t- keys to get get that kind of connection in a healthy and um, and really inspiring and beautiful way. Yes. And there is great love out there. Yes. It's everywhere. Yes. Yes. And it might not be in the way you see and think it, you know? Right. So Abby, it's just been an absolute pleasure. I want people to be able to find you. Where can they find you and all this amazing information that you have? You know, everything, the easiest 
interesting is my website, which is abbymedcalf.com. And it has the podcast there and it has, you know, my books and it has a lot of free resources, um, tons of them. It's not, there's nothing, uh, I'm not sketchy. So there's nothing weird about it. If you get something free, it's free. You don't have to put in a credit card, you know, you know there's nothing like that. You, I have a weekly mailing list um, where I share sort of experience, strength and hope every week. Uh, really, it's like a personal story and kind of mixing in a lesson um, that people really like. Again, I'm not really like selling you anything. You know, it's really meant to be a give and to be sort of on course. But everything is on the website. Anything, you know, my social media, all that you can find there. Uh, AbbyMetcalf.com with a D. Awesome. Thank you so much, Abby. Thanks for joining us. And I can't wait until you can cook me dinner because... All right. I'm ready. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Thank you listeners for, um, please, if you are listening, go and subscribe. We're on all platforms like that little plus button, go ahead and down. And if you loved what you heard today, do a five star, maybe leave a review. You can also find me on jillcoil.com as well, where we're always there to motivate you to recognize that divorce is not the end. No one dies from divorce. Thank you, Abby. Till next Thank time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed, please subscribe, follow, and share. I'd love to hear your questions and feedback. You can contact me at community at jillcoil.com. See you next time. I am an attorney, but I am not your attorney. Any advice given on the podcast is general and shall not be construed as legal advice.